Hello and welcome to the semi-finals at GP Prague. We have our first seed, Pascal Vier on our right, Stefano Vinci of Italy on our left, and uh, we'll see if it's going to be the masterpiece, taking home the long game, or if the aggro deck of Stefano Vinci can do something here. There's a Seder Wayfinder from, uh, from Pascal, finds a forest, and he's already building up his graveyard. Yeah, I think I see a Verdant Eidolon already in there. So now if you cast a multicolor spell, you can return it to the graveyard for free. Already a bit of value. Uh, very importantly, because Pascal was the, the first seed after the Swiss, he got to choose player draw. And uh, given that his deck is fairly slow, but does have a very powerful late game, uh, being on the play uh, makes it more likely that he will be able to uh, set up all of his game plans in time before Stefano's uh, fairly aggressive red-white deck can uh, can deal 20 damage. Mm -hmm. uh, the Seder Wayfinder on turn 2 was, uh, is also an important play for, for Pascal because he has a creature that can trade in the early game. His deck is notoriously a little bit slow. Yep, and it's uh, just the perfect uh, creature against a 3-1 uh, Wandering Champion. Mm -hmm. or, <laughs> or another 3-1, the Hissing Iguana. <laughs> Yeah, a good good card. A, a card has been performing really well this week, and it's really surprised me how effective it is. Just because it triggers off of any other creature dying, and uh, yeah, Pascal has to set up uh, some more blockers here and starts off with a Wicker Bow Elder that can do some decent work against some of the auras that uh, Stefano is packing. Yeah, uh, for example, there is uh, like Hyena Umbra, Hyena Umbra, two copies in his uh, in his deck. So there is definitely some value in not trading the Wickerbore Elder right away, but keeping it around. Mm -hmm. Two, four no. mana now for uh, for Stefano, who I already see uh, a double cleave in his hand, possibly also a phal phalanx leader. All right, but three mana for another hissing iguana. Wow. Yeah. Well, if he indeed has uh, Phalanx Leader and ways to target it, I don't think you want to be attacking yet. Mm -hmm. You would first want to uh, trigger the Phalanx Leader to give one additional point of toughness to all of your creatures so that you can profitably attack into the Satyr Wayfinder. Yep, that that seems like a good plan. Uh, Pascal Verne doesn't have a fifth land or or a black land. He, he already seems to have Entomb, Shriekma in his hand. He really would love a Kudama's Reach or just naturally drawing a Swamp. Yeah, well, that's uh, the risk with playing a four-color deck, to be fair. Come on, he, Frank. He, he does have <laughs> a bunch of mana fixing, but uh, yeah, it doesn't go uh, perfectly every game. Uh, you're a party pooper. I think he also has uh, yeah the, the engineered explosives there, but mm -hmm. still is looking for any third color Ooh, of mana. Magma, that can uh, really start the party going here with double hissing iguana as well. Four mana verdant Eidolon, though at least some sort of fixing for Pascal Viren. Uh We'll see if he gets to untap with the with this uh, spirit for four mana that uh, gives you th uh, kind of like a black lotus effect or mm -hmm. a, or a, um, yeah or similar. And can also come back of course if he plays a multicolor spell. Yeah, but will he have enough uh, time? Because I, I would expect uh, a pretty big attack from Stefano this turn, enabled mm -hmm. by uh, the heroic ability on that Ooh. Phalanx Leader. Ooh, I think he also has a Hyena Umbra. Look at that. So he targets the, the Phalanx Leader, puts a plus one, plus one counter on every single creature that he has. And he still has that double cleave in his hand. Mm -hmm. This is massive. Uh, I mean, it might actually be lethal this turn, depending on how Pascal blocks. Get in there. And also remember that if any creatures die, then there's going to be two Hissing Iguana triggers uh, yeah. each. Pascal Viren is tapped out, so he can't really do anything just now. There was no foil yep. uh, <laughs> uh, on his side. Now he's uh, Stefano is uh, figuring out, okay, so these Iguanas are probably going to get blocked. Yeah, especially when you still have Double Cleave in hand as uh, a combat trick that can also alternatively target the Phalanx Leader for the global mm -hmm. boost. I like just swinging in with everything. Just make life difficult for uh, for Pascal, who now has to uh, <laughs> yeah figure out how to uh, line up his blocks. Suddenly, the Sater Wayfinder is not a great blocker anymore against two toughness creatures. He doesn't really want to be blocking with the Verdant Eidolon because he needs that for mana on the next turn. The Elder, uh, well, it can it can block. Uh, it was planning to uh, you know activate its ability to get rid of any Umbras, but. He probably doesn't have the luxury. Frank, are you saying it's over? Could easily be. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, like if Pascal goes for a triple, uh, a triple jump, Ugh. then um, then Stefano could play uh, double cleave on the on the unblocked creature, deal perhaps as much as eight damage. Yeah. 
and then you get a bunch of uh, hissing iguana triggers. I it's it's not necessarily over yet, but it depends on how Pascal blocks. Well, no. Sure. All right, so he wants to keep the Verdant Idol on around. This is uh, threatening uh, 8 damage for now. Uh, I can make it 12 with a double cleave. There Correct. are also hissing iguana triggers. It triggers whenever any other creature dies, so that would be uh, 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, 5 at this point. He can I also play the double cleave on, on any of the creatures that block, you know, on the, mm. on the iguana to, to have it survive there. Yep. Yeah, I don't think he can set up lethal this turn yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that we're <laughs> we're counting <laughs> <laughs> to make sure <laughs> yeah, <pretty laughs> already signifies that this attack is uh, pretty big. Yeah, turn six and uh, Stefano is already uh, threatening a uh, big lethal off of twenty. Remember, this is not uh, Pascal is not at some sort of low uh, low life total here. And the only way I could see Pascal winning this game is if he uh, has the all his dust on the on the next turn. He does have uh, a copy of that seven mana sweeper in his deck, and. Um, all right, so he's going to play double cleave on the on the hissing iguana that was blocked, so that it, it does survive. So it's going to mean that for in first strike damage, the Wicker Bow Elder di dies. Pascal takes two from the iguana triggers, and during regular damage, Pascal is going to take eight from uh, the combat damage, and two more from uh, the Seder Wayfinder dying and iguanas, uh, clawing away two more points of life. And now Pascal's down to eight. Yeah, and 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 the the crazy thing is, is that even if Pascal has this all his dust, uh, he's still going to lose because then there would be uh, at least eight hissing iguana triggers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what can the Belgian even do to get out of this spot? Yeah, iguana. Uh, I mean, yeah, I you mentioned engineer explosive, but it's probably a little bit too late. You know, he could have if he had earlier played it for you know through three colors of mana, being able to kill. Uh, those this thing one would have been really good, but Pascal Viren loses game one to Stefano Vinci's very aggressive red white deck. Yeah, I think Pascal's mana stumble there. Uh, I mean, that is the risk you run when you register a masterpiece of mm -hmm. <laughs> four colors. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, proof decisive. Yeah, and uh, the Harrier Pro and Platinum Pro as well, of course. Now on the ropes. Uh, I I, uh, I think he was pretty disappointed in uh, in losing out on uh, in uh, GP Warsaw that he didn't get to even play the finals uh, because I I'm pretty sure you know every pro wants a trophy to his name you know I won that tournament it's something that you know you g go home and you display your trophy to your friends all your top eights and you know top sixteens at pro they are not gonna give you something to show off to your friends and family. And especially at this event, uh, oh you yeah. know, it's, a, it's a special one for many reasons. It's the, the second largest European Grand Prix of all time. Uh, and also uh, the Grand Prix for the, the last master set of the foreseeable future. So would have been uh, nice to have uh, the trophy for this one. But uh, it's, it's played, still, uh, still up in the air for, uh, for everyone in the top four. All right, so there you see Stefano Vinci's uh, deck again. Uh, you saw the Wandering Champion, he has two of those. You saw both Hissing Iguanas. Uh, and none of the Anger or Cosmic Marauders made an appearance, but it was, it was enough here. Against a slightly mana-screwed uh, Pascal Vieren, of course, he only had two colors uh, of his mana. Uh, but that's what the red-white deck can punish so well, right? Like being able to yep. uh, go get out of the gates really quickly. Yep, yeah, those Hissing Iguanas in particular were, uh, were pretty good. Uh, they fit an aggressive strategy so well uh, as a three power, uh, three mana creature. It's already fine, and the uh, the ability adds up. Uh, also, we saw Phalanx Leader do a whole lot of work because that uh, that global mm. boost. Yep. Uh, wow, that uh, definitely made the attack for uh, Stefano Vinci much much easier. Yeah, it doesn't have that many ways to trigger heroic, but if. With Phalanx Leader, you probably just need one activation if you if you already yeah. have a board of creatures. It, it's just so devastating. I think I'm seeing like six ways to target it. Mm -hmm. That, that yeah, seems like a perfectly fine, uh, fine, fine amount. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, let's uh, head on back down to Pascal Vierne's four color re a reanimator. Okay, that's also one way to call it, but it's just we call it four color masterpiece. Uh, I, I like that name better. Uh, it does need like its mana to go right. I mean, the, still, the thing when I look at this uh, deck list, like every time I look at a card, I think, oh, okay, well, there's actually a reason why it's in there. Mm -hmm. For example, that Counter Squall, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uh, kind of a negate uh, type uh, spell, but it also triggers the Verdant Eidolons because exactly. it's a multicolored one. There are all these kinds of uh, like little synergies between every uh, possible card in the deck. 
Uh, like for example, if uh, you have a Walker of the Grove as a 7-7 on the battlefield, <laughs> then past uh, all this dust, well, you're still left with uh, you know a 4-4 token uh, at the end of it. Um, all of these things uh, add up. You could even uh, do crazy things like using the Wicker Bow Elder to uh, like uh, try to destroy your own patchwork gnomes <laughs> to boost it to a 4-4 in combat and regenerate the patchwork sure. gnomes. Uh, there are so many uh, possibilities. I just love it. Yeah, it, l it looks great. But I think the key card to draw in the early game is the Kodama's Reach because if Pascal Viren uh, plays one Kodama's Reach, I think his mana is settled, and mm -hmm. uh, we, we, they can just make uh, he can just make sure that he's getting to the late game where his deck is just yep. so much more powerful than uh, whatever his opponent is doing. We see uh, Stefano Vinci is taking a Mulligan here. It's going to make it a little bit rough for for the aggro deck, but uh, we'll see if uh, if Pascal Viren's uh, hand is uh, strong enough to compete with the with the beaters on on Stefano's side. Yep. And well Pascal should be uh, able to go on the play once more, which is still quite important when playing against an uh, aggressive strategy. Yeah, we'll just uh, have to hope that uh, at least Pascal's mana works out this game so that it uh, mm -hmm. turns more into uh, an interesting uh, game. Yeah, I also have an update from uh, our other semi semi-final which is uh, Rob Dehan facing off against Alexander Rosdal, and it's actually Rosdal who is up a game uh, on his opponent. Uh, I think Alexander Rosdal has uh, gone a little bit under the radar in this tournament, but he's been doing really well. Like he was at the mm. top ta top tables all around. He was the actually I think the first person to to beat uh, Pascal Vier and, and lock him, basically lock himself into right. the top eight in uh, in round four, number fourteen. And in the like in the previous round, I did think I saw Rosdal. Uh, win a game actually because he controlled uh, Platinum Empyreon, <laughs> which says your life total can change. Yep. And his opponent literally had no way left in his deck to uh, to get rid of it and just lost to decking. <laughs> yeah, the funny funny part is that uh, it was his opponent Marcus Young actually play, mm -hmm. played an Ether Snipe to bounce something and try to go for a big attack, and his opponent okay managed to survive and then slammed the Platinum Empyrean <laughs> and Marcus Young just didn't have an answer anymore. He could only keep gaining life, but he just decked himself eventually. Yep. All right. We are all already have a turn to gener uh, generator servant, and I've seen this play in the quarterfinals. No Skuzbeck Marauders, though, on turn three. That's the play you want to make. Yeah, that is such a beating when you have a, a five power haste guy on uh, on turn three. Ooh, That's no a, third land. Uh, that is not what Stefano was hoping for. Yeah, Pascal's hand is also not the greatest. He has uh, way too many lands, though. But he did draw an artisan of coast like now, and he's he'll he'll is going to be able to play a verdant idol on here. So possibly. Uh, accelerate out that artisan, right, that so which just costs nine, I think. Yeah, the artisan costs nine. The verdant eidolon uh, can act as, l let's say, a black lotus if you invest uh, a green mana. Yeah. So once Pascal gets up to seven lands, he can deploy that artisan of Kozilek. Mm, trading well, though here, as long as he uh, keeps that verdant eidolon around, that is. All right. So God's willing, protecting the generated servant from the from the damage there, and Stefan also got to scry to the bottom. So it looks yep. like it, it wasn't a land. So he's still digging, and now at five mana, Pascal Viren. Okay, he's gonna use just four of those. Uh, there's the Tal run I mentioned, right? So if he also has some, uh, you know, black mana up, I'm already suspecting Entomb because I saw his deck. Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, but, but what would he? Well, I, I guess you might Entomb the Umburial Rites already. Sure. Yeah. But uh, maybe <laughs> another Verdon Eidolon and then uh, play a multicolored <laughs> spell, return both. Also an option for Value. sure. Value. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Talrand is one of the better rares uh, in this format. If that uh, card sticks around for uh, for multiple turn, uh, once you have uh, created say th two or three Drake tokens, it's really hard to uh, uh, to get out of that. Oh, indeed, and uh, two more swarms in Pascal's hand. Really, not not the greatest uh, set of cards. He could really use something like the Urban Evolution, or maybe it just could uh, could reach to power out the the Artisan Coast like even faster because. That's just going to be a massive beating against an opponent with so few permanents. Swing for two with the Generator Servant, no blocks from Pascal Viren. He's going to save that Talran. There's a Patchwork Gnomes. Now that's a blocker. Sure, it'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll do some blocking uh, duty. Yeah, I also see uh, uh, Engineer Explosives in Pascal Viren's hand, so he certainly has things to do here. Swing with the Talrand. He could just make Explosives for two and then uh, blow up the Generator Servant mm -hmm. to take out the possibility of... Uh, a hasty Skuzbeck Marauder on the next turn. No, I don't think he... He's probably not too scared uh, of that anyway. 
at least not not yet. There's a third mana from uh, from Stefano, and he's tapping three. What's he going to be here? A hissing iguana. That making a comeback after a very successful mm -hmm. uh, premiere in game one, opening night went well. Has Pascal drawn an instant or sorcery yet? No, I'm not sure. The Talrond is uh, <laughs> looking not as impressive as I yeah, made it out to be. Very sad, Talrond. <laughs> All right, there, the Patrick Gnomes. Get in. Aggressive. Very much I so. like it. All right, then. All right, so there is the uh, is the entomb. Yep. So look, at that's gonna give him uh, uh, a Drake, though. That's always a great start. I mean, given that he still has uh, the artisan of uh, Kozilek uh -huh. in in hand, maybe he just wants to spend his unburial rights on a verdant eidolon. Uh, it would uh, get him. Well, first of all, another Drake token. Mm -hmm. Second of all, a way to potentially ramp into the artisan on the next turn. Uh, it's it's not exactly what, uh, what 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 I would describe as your your usual imperial rights target. Sure, that's more the the seven mana haymakers. But uh, why not? It, it might do. All right, discard the oh, Kozilek. <laughs> there it is. That's an even better play. Discard the artisan and then uh, bring it back with unburial rights. And uh, now uh, <laughs> Stefano Vinci really needs something good here to deal with that big big. A uh, threat on Pascal Vier inside the board. Yeah, this is way better than getting back <laughs> for the title on. Yeah, I mean, you, you tried to maximize the value of Frank. I don't blame <laughs> yes. you for that. You wanted to cast trigger, you know. You yes. Wanted, you, you wanted to ramp it out. But, uh, yeah, this is going to be uh, be a tough one for Stefano to beat. Uh, Annihilator triggers are uh, difficult already in the late game, let alone when you were uh, stalling on uh, on lands early on. Yeah, if there's w one uh, uh, one more positive, even if uh, Stefano did have uh, a face feathers, which I don't think he even has in his deck, uh, Pascal can play <laughs> Legend Explosive for four because yep. he already has four colors of mana. But uh, this uh, <laughs> this uh, artisan of course, like he's just gonna wreak havoc. Uh, yeah. Annihilator two. And, and being a 10-9 is just humongous. I'm just glancing over Stefano's deck list. Uh, how can he get out of this? I don't think he has a, a proper way of answering uh, the, the Artisan of Kozilek. Um, especially not when you take into account the, the engineered explosive. So lining up blockers is unlikely to work. Maybe he can enter some kind of damage race where you uh, throw some tokens from, say, Molten Birth in front of the, the Artisan. But <laughs> against Pascal's board, that's going to be super difficult. Maybe, maybe eight hissing iguana triggers <laughs> somehow. Uh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, that's it's very ambitious here. I have to try something. Yeah, it looks like Pascal maybe... Yeah, I think he's going to go for an engineer explosives for three here to destroy both iguanas and, and then just rumble on with, with his board. There's three different colors of mana. There's engineer explosives. Well, the, the silver lining is that Stefano is getting at least two hissing iguana triggers. Oh. I don't think he's going to be satisfied with that. Although, we might see a concession before those triggers would even go into the stack, to be honest. Yeah, Pascal may be thinking, uh, like, he, he might, you might be thinking, like, what is, he, what is he waiting for here? Like, why, uh, why is he not attacking? Maybe he's thinking, thinking about if he wants to keep his patchwork gnomes mm -hmm. around. Yep, and he does. So, puts up a regeneration shield and blows up the engine explosives. Yep. He's going to tap the, the gnomes, of course, as uh, the regen regeneration shield is getting used up. That is how it works, indeed. Yeah, we have, as you said earlier this weekend, like you don't really see it that often anymore. Re regeneration is on downswing, and speaking of downswing, Pascal mm. Verne evens it up, and Stefano Vinci has some work to do if he wants to get to the finals here in Prague, one and one. No, it uh, did require a bit of a mana stumble from uh, from Stefano, but the masterpiece did get uh, together. <laughs> uh, yeah, like um, the card and tomb is one that uh, like it's. Uh, not just legal uh, it, it's not legal in modern right now mm -hmm. uh, would be good I think it would be very good but um, uh, I do remember playing with this card uh, back in the days when uh, you would just entomb some big creature on turn one and then cause reanimate or exhume to bring it back uh, uh, to the battlefield for just one or two mana that was a very powerful uh, interaction um, I don't think entomb has ever been used in no, a fair way. I'm not even sure there the, the, there is no fair way <laughs> no, to use it. Uh, it only goes into decks that uh, uh, that combo. P 
probably the first time someone saw this card is oh, and two, why, why, why would yeah. you play this? Uh, it doesn't really uh, get me anywhere. But uh, oh boy, for uh, for one black mana, it is a super efficient. Uh, uh, card selection spell. Yeah, so uh, since players are shuffling, I use this time for uh, for nice anecdote on into myself. So I uh, I moved to uh, a new school in Luxembourg in 2004, and uh, I, it was just after I qualified for my second pro tour, which was in Columbus, which mm -hmm. was back then extended. And my deck was actually Entomb, Reanimate, Verdant Force, Oh yeah, uh, Visara, you know th these sorts of things. It was actually a legitimate pro tour deck. Uh, that was won actually by uh, by an affinity deck that just recently came <laughs> out, right in the hands of Pierre Canali. And uh, I came back, you know, th I thought I was this big shot player, right? And, like, already playing my second pro tour at age 18. You know, my rating was still pretty pretty good, even though I didn't do that well at the, at the pro tour. And then I came to play with a, a casual group of players at my school, you know, that were just uh, super casual players, like had never played a tournament <laughs> and just had like a collection of cards. Uh -huh. And one of, one of them uh, uh, beat me by playing uh, an intrepid hero, just three mana, one, one, that taps to destroy a creature <laughs> with power of four or more. All my creatures with power of four or more. My main, main deck didn't have any creature removal. And so I, uh, as we see Stefano Vinci mulligan it down to six again. And then si since then, he refused to play me again, claiming <laughs> he's beating the best player, you know, in the area. And uh, <laughs> like whenever we, we talk every... Like, like a 100% uh, exactly. win rate. Every yep. couple of years, he just goes on about, ah, oh, I beat <laughs> you, you know, I'm still the best player out of us too, and so on. Yeah. And though, of course, he doesn't play anymore. No, it also goes to show that, uh, you know, every deck has its weakness. Exactly. Your yeah. reanimator deck was completely uh, folding to that particular uh, creature so yeah that is uh, that is magic yep it is and it was it's quite fun I, I still like to re uh, remember these moments and you know this I also bring it up because ultimate masters is kind of doing the same thing for me when I look at the cards you know some of them just really make really take me back to when I used to mm -hmm. play these cards in the limited format or d I was doing broken stuff in in some one of my friends cube it's just a really like a, a walk down memory lane yeah there's a lot of nostalgia in the in there with uh, classic mechanics, uh, just such as uh, Delve or, or Madness. Uh, always nice to see again, but also cards like this uh, Entomb. I also saw Mana Vault uh, around in the in the tournament so far. Yeah. I, I remember playing with that card back in the days. It was completely <laughs> broken. We don't really have that type of mana ramp anymore, but uh, that's what we had back in the days. Yeah. All right, game three of this semi-final between Stefano Vinci and Pascal Viren. Stefano did Morgan remember he only has three mountain, but his grip is full of red spells for now, and mm -hmm. he did scry to the top in the end. Pascal Viren kicks things off with a Thermorphic Expand, which is going to be very important to fix his mana to make sure he doesn't uh, miss a beat as he did in game one. So far, so good for, uh, for both players. Just taking the early turns to, uh, to set up, but... Uh I gotta say that uh, in a deck with Phalanx Leader, as well as uh, Wingsteed Rider, starting on turn one and turn two with uh, with Double Mountain, yeah, yeah. it's not great. All right, uh, there's an all this dust from Pascal Vien, who already has a forest, has a swamp, not that much else going on in his end. Uh, so we'll see if, if Stefano Vinci maybe can punish Pascal for the slower hand. I do see a, a Spark Spitter, Anger, soul f a Soul's Fire. As well as potentially in his Iguana, it wouldn't be too bad of a start after Mulligan. Did he board into Mono Red Aggro <laughs> somehow? I don't think so. I don't <laughs> no. think he has enough cards <laughs> no, for that. I don't think he, do he does. I mean, we did see some players playing like a heavy, heavy red decks. There's a Spark Spitter. Not the, not the greatest uh, start. And also, a Planes in Pascal Bion's hand. For three mana, he has an engine and explosive. Uh, that has proven to be quite good here and can take care of the uh, Spark Spitter. And if Stefano Vinci only has three drops in his hand, he doesn't mm. really want to develop his board further. No, you don't want to add a Hissing Iguana to the battlefield when there's uh, an Explosives on three. Yeah, definitely not. But if he has a fourth land, uh, I think we saw that Mad Prophet or, uh, or, or the Anger, uh, those could uh, work quite well. Um, actually, there was no Mad Prophet, just Anger. <laughs> it was just Anger, yeah, yeah. you're right. Uh, yeah, Pascal Verne setting up for following the f some of his following turns. I, I do send an Aether Snipe that could potentially come down on turn 6, even in all his dust potentially later mm -hmm. to clear the board if necessary. But we already saw that uh, all these mash removal is not always great against a board full of iguanas. <laughs> yep. But still, if Pascal can survive into the late game, then uh, his deck is uh, certainly the one that is better equipped to, uh, 
take advantage mm. of that. Yeah, and uh, Stefano Vinci actually using four mana to play anger, swinging for three, and uh, tr trying to ignore, uh, trying to ignore the engine explosives for now. And uh, Pascal can leave it around for a while. I think, yeah, Pascal looks <laughs> to have a last cast in his hand. At least it is the perfect uh, land configuration. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Looks like nice for him. Like almost natural domain. He didn't mm -hmm. even need a Kodama's Reach. I, I guess he used the Terramorphic Expanse. Yeah, that, that certainly has helped. I mean, you can draw those lands naturally. Yeah. I, I, I'm <laughs> still remember my, uh, the invasion mana bases, right? 666. Six, six. <laughs> those were yeah. not great. Yeah, the hope for the best. The math on those mana bases has never really checked out, but uh, <laughs> it's what we had to work with back in the days. Yeah, you were really happy for, you know, your. Uh, various uh, fixers which weren't great, but mm -hmm. they di did a job. Uh, let's see if Pascal Weir is going to pull the trigger here. He does, so he, he's using Internet Explosive to blow up that spar uh, Spark Spitter. That resolves. And also an Entomb in the end step. All right. Maybe for Unburial Rights again. That's his main combo. Okay, goes for the Arts and Codes. Like, does he, he have an Ar uh, Umbrella Rights in his hand? Uh, I would have to imagine. Otherwise, why would you go for the Artisan here? Uh, well, this uh, we might be seeing uh, a turn 5 Artisan of Kozilek. And Stefano's draw just hasn't really come together. Like, on, on that turn, he, yeah, he didn't uh, add to his board. I guess he couldn't really play the Hissing Iguana, not right into the Engineered Explosives. But uh, Pascal's still at 15, that's a fairly safe life total. Uh, okay, it's just the okay. Kodama's reach, no one barely read, but he's preparing for it. And of course, the good thing about, the, uh, you know, Entomb being basically like, like a tutor card, the mm -hmm. fact that now Pascal can draw either Entomb or Unburial Rights. Yes. And both are good to bring back the, the, the artisan there. And Maybe uh, he already has the second Entomb, he's just setting up for like the, the two turn combo. Mm hmm. All right, Stefano, this is uh, your moment. Uh, and Pascal still has the last gasp up if he needs it. He's playing it quite slow. I also think I saw Walker of the Grove in his hand. Only an two attack for, uh, for two. Yeah, this, this is just not what his uh, red-white aggressive deck was, uh, was hoping to accomplish. Mm -hmm. There's the Iguana. It's going too slow. Yeah, and last gas right away. Uh, Pascal is having none of that. Yep. He's had enough of these <laughs> pesky <laughs> lizards just pecking away at his face. And now, oh, he did draw on un burial rights. He does have it here. He's gonna, he's gonna pull the trigger. He might, he might wait a little bit. But artisan coast like just looks so good to me here. I would go for it. I would too. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to be quiet so the players don't hear me. But Pascal Vieren is slow rolling il this a little bit here. He Uses ether snipe to bounce the anger, and uh, just stabilizes the board situation for him. All right, maybe he was uh, thinking, well, how can I still uh, lose this game? And somehow envisioning, um, you know, putting the artisan uh, out there, then attacking on the next turn with Stefano, sacrificing anger and thinking, well, maybe that's somehow a sequence where I could uh, could lose. Eater Snipe uh, buys him some additional time, and the artisan will still be good uh, on this turn, for example. Right, one more Kodama's Reach. Or getting uh, rid of all those lands in uh, Pascal's deck. He's going to be all business quite soon. He already had used also Terramorphic uh, expands in the early turns, so he's went through his deck quite nicely there. So first, a tap four is into play, then he plays the Swamp from his hand, hasn't had played a land this turn just yet, and now he has five mana. Is, is this Unburial Rights time? I would have to imagine. Like, one pot potential reason for playing the Eta Snipe first would be to bait out uh, Fate Feathers, but uh, Stefano does not have Fate Feathers. And Pascal knows this. Yeah. I think the deck list were, uh, were shown to the players before the match. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's the Artisan, because of course no trigger uh, on the ability, because it, it says wh uh, uh, when you cast, so when, from your hand, of course. That's when uh, when the ability would trigger. When you cast a spell, you may return to a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Oh, there's a Soul's Fire to face! All right, it's a plan. Stefano has a plan, and the plan is try to burn Pascal Viren out. It might be a little bit more difficult. He doesn't have that much that much burn, that, no, does he? That was actually the the only Souls Fire in his <laughs> entire deck. Uh, he does have you know Magma and hissing uh, more hissing Iguana sure. uh, still lingering in his deck. So if he can somehow put that together, it might work. Also, there's still this uh, this anger going around. So if that ends up in the graveyard. He might be able to set up some uh, quick 
hasty attack, but uh, I mean, it's not like Pascal is that low on life already. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Pascal knows the the risk uh, present from the red white deck, so I imagine that the Belgian will just keep uh, a bunch of blockers around at all times. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, maybe Stefano uh, is trying to be a uh, uh, a little bit cute here, trying to maybe finagle away into. You know, sack or jump blocking with his anger and next turn, maybe, you know, playing hasty magma, maybe do something else and try to, you know, deal as much damage as possible. Yeah, well, it's a plan. It may not be a good plan or a plan <laughs> that has a high likelihood of winning, but uh, at least it is a plan. So the obvious attack is uh, just with Artisan of, uh, of Kozilek to get the uh, Annihilator trigger out there. And then leaving the Eater Snipe behind as uh, as a blocker. There's also, I think, uh, I, I believe Pascal does have a. Uh, I would say all, he has all his dust, and I think a Walker mm. of the Grove as well. So he, theoretically, he could uh, play the all his dust to to clear the board of, of all the creatures, but that might be a bit of overkill for now. He, he the Walker just seems like a huge impenetrable threat. Yeah, I think I would like that one as well. Um, like all is dust, so that uh, you lose your Eater Snipe and Stefano loses well, an Anger, which he's happy to put into the graveyard, as well as a Hissing Iguana. Not sure that is going to be the, the best use of it. Maybe you want to keep it in case Stefano draws, say, a Magma. Mm -hmm. All right, he goes for the all is dust. Again, he just really strongly dislikes the, the lizard and the Hissing <laughs> Iguana. He's like, get, his, get this out of here. All right. It's a, a little risky here. Uh, Annihilator 2 gets rid of two mountains. And to be fair, if Stefano had drawn something like a Molten Burst or other token makers, yeah. suddenly that all this dust becomes much worse yep. because of all the Hissing Iguana triggers. So. Yeah. Here, uh, uh, Stefano could actually play Magma and swing back uh, at uh, Pascal, have a two-turn clock. But unfortunately for Stefano, that card isn't cool. Like, is a two-turn clock. Ten power means this Magma is going to be on blocking duty, hello? Uh, uh, yeah, Artisan is a 10-9. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> Stefano probably, yeah, there's the handshake. <laughs> I expected nothing less there. And Pascal Viren is going to get a chance to get that GP trophy and, and bring it home. Great effort and his deck really performing at its best in uh, games two and three here. Yeah, awesome, uh, awesome to see. Uh, that artisan of Kozilek uh, won the game single-handedly for uh, for Pascal Viren. And in the end, yeah, the, the all is death just to clear the blockers. It worked out uh, well enough. Indeed. All right, so there you have the bracket. What a quick way to update the bracket. Uh, kudos to uh, to our uh, team backstage who put this together. So as you can see, a quick recap. Uh, uh, Rob Dehan and Alexander Rosda are still playing. Uh, we're going to go to have the uh, look at the match and because the winner is going to face... Oh, ho, ho, I, I'm having a sense of deja vu here. <laughs> Alexander Rosdal has a Platinum Imperial and that's basically how he won the quarterfinals. After Marcus Angelin used his only sort of interaction uh, to get some damage in, Alexander Rosdal slammed down uh, that Platinum Imperial and that means that his life total cannot change. Yeah, well, I'm looking over uh, Rob's deck list to... Uh Try to see what kind of uh, ways he has to deal with. He uh, does. At least, like, unless he's already used them. I've seen him uh, use... Um, Blast, of Genius Blast of Genius for eight. Yeah, yeah that, that works. That works. He also has Turn to Mist and Archeomancer already in play. So surely he has some something to do here. But Alexander Rosdal has a Pulse of Marasa here. Okay, he's... Okay, one shooting down, uh, uh, using fire to kill some of these creatures, and then using Stream of Consciousness to shuffle back uh, some of these cards, especially the ones targeted by Pulse of Marassi. That's the Stitch Drake and the Meringue River Plower. If you haven't seen this card all weekend long, what's going on here? Yeah, uh, this uh, you know must be uh, a cyborg card, I would have to imagine, mm -hmm. but against uh, a deck that relies heavily on the graveyard, uh, it effectively counters uh, Pulse of Murasa. 
So that's, uh, that works. Another thing that actually works with, uh, with the stream of consciousness, I can imagine Rob Dahan actually cyborging it in because he figured these games are going to go super long. And go and to decking. Shuff- yeah, yeah. He, he can shuffle up his four best cards back into his deck mm-hmm. and they're trying to win this way. But it, this was also a very nice use. He actually shuffled also two lands back into uh, Alexander Rosdahl's deck nice. so that he's more likely to draw lands. And there <laughs> well, we go. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> worked out. Yeah, worked out well. Here's a fadeless looting from, from Rob Dahan. He also has a foil also in his hand and drew a, uh, a Mahamodi Jin. Uh, still has to find a way to deal with that Platinum Empyrean, of course. Yeah. But he, at least he can slam down the flyer and uh, you can see those spider tokens. That's a spider spawning. Um, already uh, happened and still plenty of those. <laughs> he, he drew s- the two lands he, <laughs> that were shuffled in. He drew them right <laughs> away. Both the island and the Terminal for Expanse. That's pretty funny. All right, let's see what Rob Dehan can do here. He has already went through quite a few cards here. He has still has Fadeless Looting in his graveyard. Um, yeah, his blue rack deck looks really nice. Yeah, well, I have to imagine that he still has uh, like some uh, ways to deal with the Platinum Empyrean left in his library. Otherwise, uh, yeah, this game might easily come down to decking, given that Rob Dehan was using the Stream of Consciousness on Alexander and then drawing cards with Fadeless Looting. It's not like uh, Rob has uh, the plan of decking his opponent as any realistic path to victory. So it's just uh, a waiting game at this uh, at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Rob Dehan, if given if n- enough time, surely he can uh, he can find some answers. Oh, you already found Blast of Genius, so that's step one. All right. Now he needs to combine it with uh, an eight mana card. Yeah, he has. Uh, does he have anything else outside of Dig Through Time? No, I don't have his deck list. Oh, you don't have his deck list. Oh, no. Sorry. Um, I, I, I do know he has Dixie because yeah. I've already seen it in the quarterfinals because that's how he finished off the, his match. Uh, oh, here's another Archaeomancer. So maybe even if he had already played Dick through time, he can, he can bring it back. But he hasn't. It's still in his deck, I believe. Yep. His deck, I really like Blue Red Instant Sorceries, you know, card advantage. <laughs> Rob Dehan counting his library already. I mean, if that uh, Dick through time would be, let's say, the, the bottom card of his library, he might not have enough attack steps to, uh, yeah, to win even after killing the Platinum Empyrean. Um, I mean, I do have uh, Alexander's uh, mm-hmm. deck, but uh, I also don't see an easy way for him to uh, win the game at this point. There's, uh, well, the Meringue River Prowler. That can attack seven times, mm-hmm. uh, unblockable. There's Demir Guild Mage, which uh, I guess you can target your opponent yep. to, uh, yep, to deck b- him more quickly. Both modes work, yeah. Yep. Target player draws a card. We could, uh, we could be seeing that. Uh, apart from that, yeah, Alexander is not interested in attacking with any of the creatures currently on his board. All right, so Frantic Surgery is resolving and... Rob Dahan has to figure out what he wants to discard here because he has uh, s- way too many good cards. It looks like it's going to be a uh, Fatalist Looting and a Fiery Temper. Uh, yeah, and he's going to untap his lands and then uh, most likely shoot a, a Fiery Temper at. Um, well, you could target the Platinum Empyrean and two. then go for a Blast of Genius for five damage. Yeah. But he, he does not do so. I think he only has two four mana casting cost card in the hand, so mm. probably doesn't want to risk whiffing. Doesn't add up, yeah. yeah. But right. that library is uh, getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, but he still has, you know, he could always Archeomancer uh, back the stream of consciousness, shuffle, sure. uh, shuffle back four cards sure. into his library if he needs to. And uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, he also has, I think, Turn to Mist. He can actually, that's one way to win the game, right? Just Turn to Mist the, the Platinum Empyrean and try to, uh, try to find enough damage. The creature returns at the end of, uh, the, end of the turn. That would work. Yeah. Um, although, given that Alexander still has so many chum blockers between exactly. all those spiders, that is going to, be, uh, going to be difficult. I do think you need, let's say, a permanent answer mm. to the Platinum Empyrean. Well, I think so, too. All right, and uh, Alexander Rosdahl actually hasn't been playing much, and he has quite a few cards in his head. Okay, now an Archaeomancer of his own. He ha- he does have a Pulse of Mraz in his graveyard, so he certainly, I imagine Rob Dehan is going to foil this, and he does. The uh, the 1-2 gets countered. No card advantage for you here, Alexander Rosdahl, says Rob Dehan, as he is digging for his dig <laughs> through time. Very appropriately. Uh, four yeah, cards remaining. Yeah, so, cards. <laughs> so uh, on, if you play the uh, the Blast of Genius on the next turn, you guarantee to find the the dig through time. Yep. But uh, well, you also may need a turn to uh, set up the Archaeomancer 
loops on the <laughs> you know the He's stream going of consciousness. For it. Yeah, he is going for it here. He has four cards. Is is the dig through time the last card? It is. I think it is. <laughs> I think it oh is. Oh my yeah. god, <laughs> no. that's insane. No. <laughs> Uh, yep, uh, and and I don't think he could have waited uh, oh, another he turn. He scoops yep. up and Alexander Rosdal makes it to the final. He's going to be facing against Pascal Viren. Oh no, what, what were the, the odds, Frank? <laughs> what were the odds? Well, 1 in 40. Yeah? <laughs> he, I got the, the mask right here. Yeah? Yep. Sometimes uh, you run the 2.5% the and it just doesn't, doesn't really uh, add up. Yeah. Unfortunately for Rob, uh, I, I think he maximized his odds by waiting until the last you know, possible moment. Yeah. Where you could still play it and then and then win uh, in time, uh, but uh, well, <laughs> tough luck for him. Yeah, and uh, now there you see the bracket. We're going to have Pascal Viren against Alexander Rosdal, and the funny thing is that Pascal Viren's only loss so far in the whole tournament has been to Alexander himself. So Pascal could not only get revenge and and but it also could get the GP title, uh, which would be an amazing amazing achievement there uh, for for Pascal. But of course, Alexander Rosdal has had an amazing weekend himself. He's been crushing it too and now deservedly in, in the in the finals of gp Prague. there all right as i bring it back to the booth um yeah a few parting words i think uh, from uh, from me and frank here uh because uh, uh the finals will be cast by uh by tim and raf uh, they've done a great job this weekend and i'm sure you'll uh, in, enjoy their their commentary and uh just what an what an amazing weekend we had frank right uh, just if, if you could, what was your highlight of the weekend? Which play? Oh, which play in particular? Oh. Um, well, we've seen all, uh, like all so many things. Uh, we've seen stuff from uh, a Sigarda loaded up by, uh, by a Daybreak Coronet uh, into an impossible to kill uh, threat. We've seen uh, teamer players burn out opponents by going Blast of Genius, Deal 9, Vengeful Rebirth. <laughs> deal yeah. another nine. <laughs> uh, we have seen uh, Pascal Viren play uh, more than three spider spawning over the yep. course of uh, of a single game. Uh, I, I don't even know where to begin. Ultimate Masters is filled with so many sweet things to do. Uh, do you have any like a play that really stands out uh, to you? Uh, because I to me, it's it's like like the combination of the whole format. Yeah, it, it's true. Like oh, I really like Pascal Viren's uh, uh, swing for a huge damage out of nowhere, thanks to Anger, mm. Bench Vine, and so that was just a really sweet play. And if you could, I definitely recommend you to to re rewatch it. But there were so many times where I needed to raise my voice out of excitement <laughs> for what is happening here and it's been a really a blast so before i hand you over to tim uh, and uh, araf i really wanted to thank you for tuning in uh it was really nice to be able to host uh frank a good friend uh, and uh, and a fantastic magic player with you and i really do hope to see uh you again on the other side of the virtual glass uh enjoy the finals